Okay. Hi. So, uh, high speed traffic encryption on x86 64 with Snap. So, hi, I'm Max. I'm an open source hacker and I've been working on the Snap project since 2014. Some of you may have heard of it. Uh, I'm going to go a little bit into it later in this talk. Um, I'm also doing consulting on software networking in user space, protocols, uh, software optimization, etc. So, for the last couple of years, I've been working on a project called Vita. Uh, Vita is a high performance side to side VPN gateway. It's fully open source and it's hackable. By hackable here, I mean that it has a very small and hopefully easy to understand code base. And it runs on generic x86-64 server CPUs and Linux. So Vita is based on Snap. Uh, Snap is a toolkit for writing fast networking applications in user space. Uh, this mode of operation is also referred to as kernel bypass mode. You've all heard of it, I guess. Uh, but basically it means the data path completely avoids the Linux kernel. And um, Snap applications, including Vita, and this is the important bit, Snap itself even, are uh, written in a high-level programming language called Lua. Um, and this is possible thanks to a super fast implementation of Lua called Lua JIT, um, which we have a fork of called Raptor JIT, which I'm going to have a talk about tomorrow in the Minimalistic Languages staff room in case you're interested, um, which is basically a fork of Lua JIT that uh, targets heavy duty server applications specifically. And by the way, Vita was funded through the Nanonet Foundation. They are really, really cool, and I suggest you check them out if you are in need for funding for any open source project. So I guess let me start by showing you some typical Snap code. So Snap programs are divided into modules that we call apps, which have a number of input and output links, and they pro basically process packets in a loop. So this example shows how to read packets while the input link is not empty. Uh, check if their time to live has expired. And unless they have, uh, if they have not expired, if the time to live has not expired, then we forward the packet to the output link. If the TTL has expired, then we will transmit the packet onto the time exceeded link, where it will be received by another app that would ham handle ICMP, for example. So what does high performance mean in this context? Um, at the moment, Vita terminates 3 million packets per second on a single CPU core. Uh, that translates to about 5 gigabits of iMix traffic per core. And these numbers are full duplex. So this is actually 6 million packets being processed per second on a core, 3 million being encapsulated, and 3 million being decapsulated. And the median term performance goal of Vita is to be able to do 100 G uh, on a generic x86 server that you can buy off the shelf. So here I'm betting on increasing core count sizes, obviously, and I'm thinking that maybe a Zen 2 with 64 cores might just be able to do it. So how does Vita do it? Um, in Snapland, we like to write software that is both fast and simple. So we think that simple designs translate to efficient designs, and we don't think that fast programs need to be complex. We also like to avoid vendor lock-in wherever possible. So for Vita, this means we avoid any extensions such as Intel Quick Assist or proprietary crypto cards to get the performance and rely on um, x86-64 and its commonly supported uh, architecture extensions. Commonly supported here means that more than one vendor produces CPUs that can do that stuff. Right, so Vita's most obvious CPU hawk is obviously encrypting packets and decrypting them, basically crunching numbers. Um, and for that, we rely on two x86 extensions, uh, AESNI and AVX2. Uh, AESNI provides CPU instructions to do a round of AES, basically. And AVX is a SIMD uh, extension. You've probably heard of it. SIMD here stands for Single Instruction Multiple Data. Two talks ago, you've heard about that. And yeah, this, this code snippet shows that shows how we use a dynamic assembler called DINASM, which uh, ships with a Lua JIT, uh, to implement AES-JCM using uh, the mentioned instruction set extensions. 
Um, for route lookups using longest prefix match, we use uh, optimized pop tray implementation. Um, again, here we use DIN ASM to generate the lookup routine, uh, but everything else about this implementation is actually written in high level Lua. So we have a high level Lua implementation of all the like surrounding code, and then the lookup routine that actually needs to be fast is generated at runtime. And the reason DIN ASM is cool for this sort of stuff is that it lets you generate code based on algorithm parameters and even CPU features at runtime. So we kind of like say, oh, you want to use this key size for your LPM lookup, we're just going to generate an assembly routine to the lookup really fast. And both the pop try and AES-GCM implementations are upstream for you to reuse. So with Snap, we maintain a library of all this stuff, which you can basically plug and play with. Right. So we also wrote a simple and fast IPsec ESP implementation in Lua. Um, ESP here stands for Encapsulating Security Payload. That's kind of like the standard um, IPsec encapsulation standard thingy. Um, here I'm showing how to represent packet headers as C-structs in Lua code using the foreign function interface. And in Lua, you can access these as if they were like native Lua objects, meaning object dot field member. Yes. Right, and then another thing that I thought was cool is that uh, we have this compiler, or there is this compiler for PCAP filter expressions. That's the TCP dump um, language for matching stuff. And, and there's an implementation of that language called PFLUA, developed by Galia, which is included in SNAP. And it also extends the language, the PF filter language, um, to be able to express um, match action pipelines and this is basically another example of code generation uh, at runtime that's really prevalent in Snap, where we have some a DSL and we compile that to either native code or, for example, I've recently written an eBPF backend for that to be able to um, have BPF filters running as XCP programs. Yeah. In either way, uh, I feel like this is a really robust way of writing this sort of program. Um, first of all, you don't you don't do the mistakes when doing like little bit poking on packets, and and second of all, there's really, I mean, this is already kind of like efficient, being compiled, to to specialized code just for this instruction and not like general being a general purpose language. But there's still a lot of optimization potential, completely unclaimed in this. Um, for example, we could compile this expression using SIMD, or whatever really. And that's stuff that's currently not done, but very much feasible. What's my time thing? All right. Right. So the way security associations, and that's flows basically, work in ESP uh, presents some constraints with regard to parallelization. For security reasons, every packet transmitted over a security association has a unique, monotonically increasing sequence number. So if we want to distribute the work of processing one security association that's like one flow across more than one core, we run into a problem where we end up having to synchronize them in one way or another in order to not reorder packets. Uh, and this is a known issue in implementing IPsec, and there are papers written on this topic, really. We actually really want to use multiple cores, however, because doing 3 million packets per second on one core is nice, but really only makes sense if you can scale that in some way. And for Vita, uh, we decided to sidestep that issue rather completely by imitating a scale-out architecture internally. That is, we, pre we pretend that every core is its own node with its own address and kind of like do the, the network scaling as a network engineer might do it, I imagine, um, in the program and don't try funky, funky uh, inter-CPU core uh, synchronization tricks, which always end up being complex and slow. So at this point, we move the problem into the network layer and can let two common network device features take care of it uh, in hardware. Um, the first of that is like receive side scaling, which I guess is well known here, uh, which lets us um, distribute flows received on the private interface uh, onto separate security associations for each core. And the other one is VMDQ, which is originally a virtualization extension, 
which lets us aggregate uh, separate security associations on, received on the public interface before forwarding them to the respective core. And on the next slide, yeah, there's a high-level overview of this architecture. Um, there are two queues here, Q1 and Q2, which run on separate CPU cores. Uh, on the left, you have the private interface running in RSS mode. It has one address. Um, it splits the flows onto the CPU uh, cores and on se with separate queues. And on the right, we have the public interface, where each of the cores slash queues has a separate public address. And um, this means that each queue can then negotiate security associations independently and process an even chunk of the traffic without any synchronization uh, with the other queues. So we just don't have that problem anymore. All right. So on drivers, um, the snap way is to write simple network card drivers in Lua, even if vendors do not always make that easy. Uh, Luke Gorey had a talk on the subject, I think, one or two Fostems ago. And I hear that nowadays he's soldering a network interface card himself. And for me, I can say that recently I've worked on XDP and Intel AVF drivers for Snap and hence Vita. The immediate goal of AVF and more, more, um, more prominently XDP is to make Vita easily deployable in the cloud. So the idea is that if we could have some very common prevalent interface that we can rely on to be available in the cloud, then we could easily deploy Snap applications there. Um, on XDP, I can report that the in initialization sequence is a bit heavy for my taste personally. Like, to me, it's easier to initialize a reasonable hardware interface of a NIC than XDP. Um, but overall, it was a fun hack. And a good reason to read kernel source code as any, if you ask me. Uh, I hit some limitations with XTP, which have mostly to do with conflicting uh, memory allocation models between XTP and SNAP. However, it seems that working with kernel upstream uh, on these issues looks promising. And at that point, I wanted to say kudos to Björn Töpel for helping out with that. That was pretty great. And if you're interested in the topic, I have a blog post on the whole um, how to do XTP without uh, libbpf can check that out. All right, it's five minutes. Let me see. All right, gonna... right, so there's um, the issue of authenticated key exchange. As you might have guessed, um, we did something else there as well, since we didn't want to do IKE. Um, authenticated key exchange is kind of like the tricky bit of the, of the whole thing. Um, you want to cycle security associations often and without losing packets. Uh, you want to cycle that often be to be able to provide uh, strong forward secrecy. And while this is kind of like a low throughput part of the system, it's quite complex and by far provides the biggest attack surface you can, you can find. Um, yeah, I mean, if you, if you want to get a feeling for that, check out the IKE RFC. It's huge. Um, so I ended up with a simple pre-shared key-based protocol based on the noise protocol framework, which I can really recommend. That's something quite modern and um, quite clean. If you have a need of some cryptographic key exchange TLS-like thingies, you should, I think, look at them. They have a really good like community where you can figure out how to do this in a modern way. Um, and yeah, for that, we use a minimal set of modern cryptographic primitives. Uh, our DNA is M-based aes implementation, the sandy 2 x implementation of Curve 25519, which is written in assembler, I think, and the Blake hash reference implementation on you. <laughs> uh, the Blake hash reference implementation, which is written in C. Um, yeah. And alternatively, I plan to support uh, full IKE version 2. Uh, Switch engineer Alexander Gall has developed a strong SWAN plugin to provide interoperability with SNAP. So basically you could use strong SWAN if you really want to use AKE, IKE, and we would kind of like have a plugin for strong SWAN to be able to consume the security associations negotiated by it. Right. Um, and I guess lastly, SNAP comes with a fairly complete Yang library. Um, Vita manages configuration and runtime state using a custom Yang model. 
that means you can query and update configuration uh, and also the runtime state using Yang RPCs. And um, of course, you also get the configuration validation that comes with the model. And yeah, below here is an example of querying the runtime state of a running Vita application. All right. So that's it for me. You are welcome to get involved with this uh, project, both Vita and Snap. Uh, we're on GitHub. Um, if you want to get more of the gritty details on that, I try to journal as much as possible of this on my blog, where I go like deeper into certain subtopics of this. Uh, also, I offer support and consulting on this, um, both Vita and Snap again, via my consulting company, Interstellar. And if you have any questions, please ask them now in the hallway or shoot me a mail. Take a question there? Yes, yes, please, go ahead. So, um, I've kind of um, looked at the, the, let's say, the Lua packet processing ecosystem. There's Snap, there's Vita, there's MoonGen, and then MoonGen mm. built on the Moon. So there's a whole kind of little kind of, uh, let's say, boutique ecosystem of Lua-based mm -hmm. uh, da data plane uh, what, what do you see the advantages of that are compared to uh, compared to using DPDK? Uh, mo mostly size, size and complexity. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah. So the question was, what's the advantage of using uh, doing packet processing in Lua as opposed to do it in C with DPDK, for why example, why or VPP? Start, why didn't you start with DPDK? Why did you go with Lua instead? Um, well, me personally, I started with Lua because I was hired to work on that. Um, <laughs> And I guess the answer for most people that work on DPDK is the same, just the other way around. Um, however, um, for me personally, it really boils down to size. Um, one goal that we had with Snap, so, so just to repeat that, Vita is based on Snap, it's written in Snap, it's not like it's a separate thing, it just uses that as its like, toolkit to work. And one goal that we had from the very beginning is that we want like, non-hardcore programmers to be able to do network programming with performance. Um, we have some use cases where network engineers use Snap as sort of a kind of like a debugging introspection shell where network engineers write like little programs to, to um, debug their traffic, their things. And we ha really had this like idea that you shouldn't be, it should, it, should, it should be less expensive, it should be more easy, it should be less complex. And I think if you compare the code base sizes, you will see what I'm talking about. It's like really, really a difference in, in just size and scope. So. We want to keep it simple, and uh, a simple networking toolkit means that we also want to use a simple language, and C is not that. Okay. Yes, please. Uh, so um, you're using a direct kernel bypass to get the network packets, mm -hmm. but crypto crypto uh, cryptography is quite CPU intensive. So does the direct bypass make actually make any difference in your use case, or would just using normal sockets uh, work? Uh, on big package, on 1,500 byte packets, probably not. On 60-byte packets, yes. So it's a, like encryption on modern CPUs, especially if you're doing something that's um, supported widely, like AES GCM, where you have like AES CPU instructions for that, it's actually quite fast. A single core can encrypt beyond 20 gigabits a second easily. Um, but you're not hitting that rate ever when you're doing small packets, because for, that, for, for it to hit that, you kind of like have to give it a long, long chunk to work on. So you really end up being... Um, bottleneck by just the usual number of packets per second issue. And the kernel is really bad at that. Anybody else? Yeah, please. I also have a second question. So, uh, you, I got from your slides that you actually implemented some parts of the cryptography and key exchange and all these algorithms in Lua directly, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, how can you be sure that there are no side channels in there? especially those that might be introduced by the JIT, not by you yourself, mm -hmm. but the JIT kind of optimizes something in a way that then induces a side channel. Not necessarily in the privileges, yeah. but maybe oh, that's a good question. creating a comparison, thinking it might be done earlier or something. Yeah, yeah. so there's no actual cryptographic like primitives written in Lua. Um, so the primitives are all either assembly or their respective C implementations. And while we use Lua to generate the... So DNASM is a dynamic assembler. You write Lua code that generates assembly code, but what you actually run in the end is not any Lua, but just assembly code. And like, why is the AES 
constant time because the AES instruction on x86 CPU uses constant time, and we're executing that. So that's something definitely we have to make sure that we don't do that. But yeah, that's basically how we know. the SDN Dent Room Day for FOSDEM 2020. Um, we'd really appreciate it if you'd help us out in two ways. If you'd leave feedback.